Hello. Thank you very much for coming. Even though you had no real alternative. <laughs> so when I, when I first began pitching this talk to conferences, it was back in September 2016. It was still warm and sunny in New York. People were grilling hot dogs outside. Uh, Americans were still worried about exactly which pantsuit Hillary Clinton was going to wear to her inauguration. <laughs> Nowadays, New York City is a cold, dark wasteland filled with snow and political dissent. Um, but I decided to go for this talk anyway, because if there is a mobile platform that is of and for the people, it is definitely the first open source mobile platform, Android. And if speaking up for it is populism, then I'm guilty as charged. So my friend Virginia Polchak made the illustrations for this talk. If you see a really cool one, it's her. If you see a boring slide, that one is me. So four years ago, I interviewed at Google Developer Relations. Uh, and one of the questions they asked in my interview was, why would you advise the CEO of a company to launch on Android first. And at the time, I wasn't quite as ballsy. And also, I wanted a job. So I said something about tablet support and flexible layouts. What I remember thinking at the time is that was a complete lie. I would never have said to the CEO of a company in America that they should launch first on Android without having like some serious extenuating circumstances. I would have lost all credibility, because in America, it's a fact in the mobile world that you would launch first on iOS. But I thought at the time, this is all a big mistake, right? This is why I'm joining the team in the first place. Surely I could help the nice people at Google explain things. We would make a difference and we'd turn the situation around. Well, uh, about two months ago, WikiLeaks broke a big story on the CIA hacking into mobile devices. Personally, I've already given up on privacy, so I didn't really read the part about the hacking. But the New York Times article I read characterized the market this way. Apple has only 15% of the global smartphone market versus Google's Android, the most widely used smartphone operating system. Okay, so why bother hacking the iPhone at all? The New York Times articles go on to say, a uh, quote from WikiLeaks, the intensive CIA effort was probably explained by the popularity of the iPhone among social, political, diplomatic, and business elites. I really love this phrase. <laughs> it's worth noting it's a useful shorthand for rich people. <laughs> but continuing on, how did we get here? It all started in 2007 when Steve Jobs stood up on stage in a black turtleneck and he introduced a widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communicator. This was the turning point of my career. I didn't know it then. I had dropped out from MIT, and I was serving drinks to people who had iPhones. <laughs> but it was a full year, uh, October 2008, until Google shot back. And this is what it looked like. So it had the notification shade. It actually had a pretty cool version of Google Maps, including Street View. It had the Android market. It was also pretty funny looking. And there were a lot more funny looking phones to come. So we were late to the party, and we were the nerds. Meanwhile, to this day, Apple has produced exactly eight models of the iPhone. And that is consistent with its placement as a luxury item. After all, you don't customize a Ferrari. You buy it because it's perfect the way it is. It's the kind of thing you would do with a Honda Civic. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, Android has positioned itself differently from the very start. It's been open source and customizable down to its bones for anyone who wants. And that means that the Android narrative has been multiple. Uh, some might say co-opted or fractured, even fragmented. On the other hand, some people would say that's the fundamental strength of the platform. 
It can be all things to all people. The problem is it hasn't necessarily been aspirational. So when I first agreed to switch from iOS development to Android development at the New York Times, I had absolutely no idea what I was getting into. Uh, but I very quickly became aware, and when you start looking for these snubs, at least in the US, they are everywhere. You could call them Android microaggressions. <laughs> an example which everyone who's ever had an iPhone or knows anyone who has an iPhone is aware of is the green bub bubbles in the messaging app. Unlike some other conspiracy theorists, I don't believe that the green bubbles are an intentional plan by Apple to sort people into an in-group and an out-group. But they are an amazing demonstration of how firmly people believe this. The blog where I took this post from described it as a goofy class war. <laughs> the first personal blow for me was at a club called Equinox. It's a very fancy chain of luxury gyms that I joined back when Google was paying for my membership. Uh, it's great. Just, just taking a shower at this gym feels like going to the spa. Even working out there is almost fun. Uh, at the time I joined, they only had an iOS app, but I figured, you know, they don't lack for money. Their Android app must be quickly on its way. But one day, I was booking a class on their website, and I discovered how they advertise their iOS app. The app. That's when I realized they would only ever have an iOS app. Not because they couldn't afford to, because Equinox doesn't serve those people. Naturally, in protest, I stopped going to the gym at all. Now, Instagram is another, maybe the most widely quoted example of why iOS first, iOS only, until you are dragged kicking and screaming, is the best way for a startup in the United States. Instagram is, of course, the social media platform that makes you and your life look more beautiful and exciting than you really are. Um, Instagram launched on iOS, and it was acquired for $1 billion dollars on the week that their Android app finally launched for the first time. The message being, we didn't even need to do this. <laughs> so the implication in the Instagram example is especially damaging, that not only don't you need Android to succeed, but that snubbing Android is actively the key to success. Get your app in the hands of beautiful people, or dogs, with beautiful phones, be exclusive. And the last example people like to give is Coachella, which is a music festival where beautiful people like to hang out. And this example is based on an interview by Robert Scoble. Never mind that Robert Scoble once took a picture in his shower wearing Google Glass. And it wasn't even the shower equinox. <laughs> Now, I may be bitter because I've never gone to Coachella. It can't be harder than getting a ticket to Google I.O. Anyway, he gave this interview in which his guest reveals that 90% of the users of their festival app were on iOS. Now, that might have to do with the fact that their Android app has a two-star rating on the Play Store, and it looks like this. But really, who knows? I hope you're getting the sense, though, that this battle of the platforms in the United States isn't a democracy. Because if every mobile phone user casts a ballot, 85% of the world has already chosen Android. Even in the US, where we use democracy loosely, uh, <laughs> some 55% of our mobile users have already chosen Android. And nor is it strictly a question of serving the wealthy. I like to joke that iOS users are just stuck up, which luckily is a personality trait available across income lines. Uh, some, do some developing nations are dominated by Android because of low-cost phones, but that's not the case for, Android, uh, for Europe. For example, Poland has an overwhelming preference for Android. Uh, Japan loves the iPhone, but China and South Korea are Android territory. And while the average price of an iPhone is higher than the average price of an Android, Android users do have plenty of high-end choices. Uh, the time I wrote this, the base model of iPhone 7 was $649, but a new Google Pixel would be $649. Total coincidence, I'm sure. Uh, it were a Samsung Galaxy S7 Edge, for those people with 45 degree bevels on their fingers, um, $669. So 
You see, there's plenty of choices at all price points, but only one has come to mean I belong to a community of tastemakers. So it's a popularity contest. It's about who's cooler on the playground, and I'm convinced that has no place in our tech policy today. So why launch on Android first? Because it's better for the world? I think it's obvious that it is, but let's be real, we're not in the business of charity. Ah, oh, one second. Am I doing this right? <laughs> so will it make companies more money? It's a good question, and I am here to argue that yes, it will. Now if that's so obvious, Lisa, why are all these companies who love money still launching on iOS first? I think it's very easy to look at data points and misread the conclusions. For example, you could look at the fact that women currently earn 18% of computer science degrees, and we hold 26% of positions in tech. Tech hiring is supposed to be a merit-based process, so you could assume that means women simply aren't good at computer science. If you look at my code, I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> uh, but instead, our industry has been convulsing itself lately, realizing that human beings don't always make strictly logical decisions. We discriminate against people who don't look like us, share our life experiences, use the same type of phone, even unconsciously, even after being told these decisions will result in worse outcomes. For us, we act against our own self-interest. I know, it's weird. So I'm not the first person to stand up and say we need to hire more women. But maybe I'll be the first person to say we should all be launching on Android first. <laughs> so a lot of the cost of building a mobile app is simply figuring out what works. Sometimes it's not clear how to structure an API. Sometimes when your users try your app, the only features they want are ones that you didn't think are important. It's rare to get it right the first time, in tech or in life, and the cost of mobile development includes that innovation. So this churn of innovation is one reason lots of people defend the iOS first approach. Often it takes, say, 75% of the time figuring out what you really want to build, and 25% of the time to build it. If you have two teams simultaneously trying to build the same product, you'll duplicate that churn. If you wait until you've done it on one platform, it'll only take, say, an additional 25% of time to port the feature to the second. On the other hand, if you always innovate and launch first on one platform, you are getting it wrong. You're wearing out the developers on one platform with constant requirement changes. At the same time, you're boring those on the second platform to death. So in both cases, you're running great developers into the ground for no reason. Instead, distribute the cost of innovation between platforms. You can do this without losing efficiency. Hire equal numbers of iOS and Android developers and have them each write a different feature and then tell the other one how they did it. Make your teams work together and share their learnings. It's the same investment, but without making one platform come last in line. Now, if I had a dollar for every time someone came to me and said, it's harder to hire on Android, I'd have a great source of passive income. So after all this time, I feel like the problem isn't the documentation. It's not the lack of tutorials. It's not the pipeline. Google has really doubled down on providing resources from the Google Developer Channel to the Udacity courses to Android certifications. And I'm not even being paid to say this. Let me break it to you. We only have so many computer science graduates, and these people we want to hire are the best and the brightest. They make it through competitive tech schools or mobile boot camps, or they even taught themselves. And now they want to choose a team with great resources at a company where they are given the tools for success. So unless you offer that, Android developers will go somewhere different. Maybe a big global company that has already conceded that Android is important. <laughs> Maybe an Android consultancy, where you'll have to pay twice as much for people to make your app. 
or, or they'll move out of specializing in Android at all. And I pray for these souls or these lost people every day. But if you're struggling to hire, you have to ask yourself, are you offering the chance to go first? Or are you offering leftovers? Prioritize Android and we will come. So a lot of what is called device fragmentation, I think should be called screen diversity. Android devices have pioneered new form factors from the beginning. Everything from sliding keyboards to Google Glass to the rise of the phablet, these all happened on Android. Having to make a design for lots of screen sizes shouldn't be radical. We do it on the web every day. So what I say it's time to throw off the shackles of recycled iOS screens and demand quality, flexible layout designs to start with for Android devices of all shapes and sizes. But what about version fragmentation? I mean, we're all familiar with the iOS model. On Android, most devices get platform updates more slowly. So we basically use logical branching by API level to turn features on and off, which is called degrading gracefully. Usually it's easy, especially if you are allowed to leave the features off. <laughs> So that means a good Android app is the opposite of an iOS model. It's absolutely going to be different on different people's phones. And that's a good thing. It's better to build a great app for 75% of your users than one that's just okay for everyone. So why am I even still talking about this? Because it's not a done deal. The struggle isn't over. Lots of product managers and publicists don't agree with me. Why not? I'm right, but they have iPhones. So they're used to the iOS model. So since this is a political speech, I'm gonna spin this. Reject the one size fits all release model. Be bold, build new features optimistically. Build for the future. Go ahead and support the latest APIs as soon as you can for your newest users. The good news is that today it's never been easier to justify or explain a staggered or partial product launch. Today's iterative development, staged rollouts, and the fact that many companies are A-B testing in the wild means that trying to release an entire fully baked feature for all of your users on any platform is becoming a thing of the past. If you can explain why the Play Store debuted a feature six months ago, and only 5% of us have it. You can explain why 75% of your Android users got a new feature. <laughs> really. So a pretty common situation is an app that launched on iOS four years ago. Let's say that it now has 4 million downloads and 1 million active users. Two years ago, our example app finally decided to launch on Android. So now they have two million downloads on Android and half a million active Android users. Their product team concludes they should continue launching new features exclusively on iOS since it has twice the market share. They hire additional iOS engineers, they debut new features on that platform, and only later, if at all, do they get ported to Android. Well, here's a funny thing. I accidentally mislabeled these graphs. This startup launched on Android first. Now they have twice as many users on Android. Now their iOS team is in the doghouse for not delivering results. But that wouldn't happen, people say, but it would. Both of these apps gained half a million users per year of release. These graphs have the same slope. It looked right to you in the first scenario, but in the US we've probably never seen the second. So what continues to, dis to drive this mobile usage disparity is the decision, purely the decision to launch iOS first. Why are we still building exclusively for a platform used by a fraction of users? Because other companies do it. Because influencers are on iOS. Because tech founders have iPhones. And so does everyone they know. Well, 
Guess who influencers are? Social, political, diplomatic, and business elites. <laughs> Guess who tech founders are? Social, political, diplomatic, and business elites. These reasons are as hard to articulate as culture fit, and I argue they are as bad a reason to use to choose a platform for launch. Why hire men to be doctors? Because most doctors are men. Why launch our app on iOS? Because iOS is the platform most apps launch on. The more you try and defend this decision, and I find most people will try, at least initially, the shakier it becomes. So what I'm really advocating here is equality. Much like feminism is not about advocating, uh, it's about women having equal rights, not, rec not recommending that women run the world. Not that that's a bad idea. Um, so I'm really just advocating fairness in mobile. I want Android, the platform that 85% of the world uses, to get the standing that it deserves. So saying that Android apps don't make as much money per person is like saying that only 4% of women advance to the highest corporate levels of tech. Well, that's true. That means we're not giving them a chance. We're launching them later. We're chronically underfunding them. We're loading them with fewer features. And we're giving them half-baked designs, if at all. I'm speaking about Android apps here. We're ignoring the purchase models that have chosen to be the most effective in 85% of the population in-app purchase, because 15% of the population prefers initial purchase. So of course Android apps are struggling to make money. It's time for us to give them a real chance. So first of all, if you have a new startup, I advocate launching on Android first. Think of all the tech think pieces that you could start on Medium. <laughs> or launch a minimal product on both iOS and Android at the same time and alternate feature development. Translate your app. The text inside the app, your title, your description, your update notes. All of those little hints in the Play Store about internationalization are based on data. This isn't a charity exercise. They are there to make your company money. It blows my mind that so many companies simultaneously maintain that their products don't make as much money on Android, and then they refuse to translate their apps. A huge percentage of Android users are from outside the US. So expecting a strictly English language Android app to succeed wildly without any kind of translation is like launching an iOS app in only Russian. I guess it might be popular in the White House. Um, <laughs> but launching an app isn't like opening a digital, uh, isn't like on, opening a storefront. In this digital age, no country is an island, except for Australia, New Zealand, Japan. I, okay, I guess that was a bad example. But prepare your app for internationalization from the beginning so that you can appeal to your full user base. Android's reach across the world is one of its greatest strengths. So some other people suggest the only reason to launch first on Android is if you can only launch on Android. And there are apps like this. They're often utilities, like custom launchers, or they're embedded systems, or custom tablets. These companies are an awesome example of what's possible on Android, but they're a tiny minority of use cases. Instead, we should focus on restoring true excellence and competitiveness in the Android apps we already have. Many of them are widely used and deeply appreciated, despite the fact they're made with fewer resources or missing features. Think of the additional success they could achieve. And we should be launching new ones on at least an equal footing. The great news is you are the most qualified person at your company to know how your product could be better on Android. And if that makes you intimidated, don't be. You don't have to be a visionary to drive change. Something I've always enjoyed about working on Android, it's also occasionally made me want to commit homicide, is how involved and opinionated our users are. If you don't have an idea right now about how your app could be uniquely better on Android, I bet your users do. <laughs> In the meantime, if the next feature your mobile team is developing 
isn't platform specific, ask if your team can do it. Share in your company's innovation. If you keep hearing that they can't find you new senior Android engineers, ask if you can mentor someone more junior and grow your team that way. You don't just have knowledge, you also have influence. So push for Android to be funded equally in your companies and allocated equivalent resources. Insist that your designers produce quality native designs and insist that your developers only implement quality native designs. The tech world needs to recapture that energy, that excitement, that momentum of reaching out to a huge number of ordinary people across country borders, and yes, across that greatest of divides, across mobile platforms. <laughs> it's better for users, it's better for your company, and most importantly, it's better for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>